Good morning. You're listening to Central Wisconsin's 24-hour information station, AM 1320 WFHR. It's time now for the Morning Magazine, brought to you by the Riverview Hospital in Wisconsin Rapids and Comfort Air Heating, Cooling, Plumbing. Now, with the Morning Magazine, here's Carl Hilke. Thank you, Jerry, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's show on AM 1320, as well as on the web at WFHR.com, and we also wel- welcome our friend uh, Jesse from River Cities Media, uh, who is uh, uh, videotaping our uh, conversation this morning, and uh, you can watch it on your favorite uh, cable channel, and also online at River Cities Media, and uh, the phone lines are going to be open this morning because Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Zach Verwink is here for the entire show. And we're going to be doing it in two parts, and I'll let the mayor explain what he wants to do with that. Uh, The second part will deal with the budget and budget questions. Uh, But, uh, Mayor Verwink, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about neighborhoods in part one of today's show. With that, we welcome the mayor of the city of Wisconsin Rapids, Zach Verwink. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Carl. Uh, nice brisk day. <laughs> it is. It's cold out. Are you a deer hunter? I am, and I've got the beard to prove it this year. Yeah, I noticed. Came back the second year in a row. I don't know. I'm not sure if I like it or not. <laughs> okay. <I'm gonna> run. <laughs> hey. I you know, people go, Carl, are you a deer hunter? No, but I hope you deer hunters get <laughs> the Bambi so I don't get it with my vehicle. Uh-huh, well, good luck. Uh-huh. You might have some Population tracking snow. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we are going to be talking neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So, again, joining me today, we've got Kathy Roche, who has been uh, working very diligently with her neighborhood over in the Ward 1 district in Chad Whirl, uh, Chad Whirl's District 1. Uh, so we're, we're pleased that she was able to join us this morning really to talk about um, some of the progress she's made since the last time she's been on air. Uh, we had her on, I think, last May when we first talked about the Ward 1 cleanup and really didn't know what to expect with that first cleanup. And uh, it's, been, it's been a great run, I think, um, by many estimations in the last number of months. And I think her story in that district, in that area, in those neighborhoods is really just fascinating to me uh, from City Hall's perspective, just because of the different approach that they've taken in, in terms of neighborhood cleanup, but also neighborhood policing and community safety. Okay. Well, welcome. Hi. Hi. Hey, I'll get right by that microphone. Already, Carl, okay. I'm okay. Here. Oh, now, uh, Ward One, your ward is a kind of a, a historic ward in the city. Uh, yes. There's a lot of historic homes. There's a, a historic uh, uh, church there mm-hmm. in St. Lawrence, and, and uh, it's you know, it's part of the older west side uh, of the city. So uh, it's actually two churches. In fact, they're going to be doing some oh, yeah, yeah. renovations. It looks like we just oh, by the, the Baptist, yeah, the right, some, which used to be the uh, the original home of St. Paul's Lutheran. Yes. Oh, is that right? Okay, yes. okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, see, beautiful church. Yeah. So I mean, you got some historic mm-hmm. buildings mm-hmm. in this area, some older homes and the like. And so, talk about what you envisioned when you started this effort, and now that you've done it. Did you accomplish everything you wanted to do? Only the first step. It's just like every journey begins with the first step, Carl. Um, Yes, we had a very successful cleanup in May, May 18th. We had 42 people volunteer. We had the beautiful, bright, safety green shirts, thank you, from the city was provided. And we were out there, and we really did a lot of work. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I mean, in October then, we did our second one. So these are are part of our first step. What do I envision? Really polishing up this district. There, like you said, there's so many beautiful historical homes that are just gems. I call our district a diamond in the rough, as I call our city is just like a jewel. So what do I want to do but get everybody on board, get everybody excited and involved to be part of our team, to really care to make a difference. By that I mean clean up. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of my favorite thing to do. I guess my mother raised me that way. So in other words, what's happening is as I'm retired and I'm a retired nurse from public health, and to me, that's part of public health, safety, and making whatever your environment, make it beautiful. Okay. Now, you said you had a a, a good start, and then you did a... uh a fall cleanup. Yes. How did, how did that go? Uh, halfway. In other words, we had half the people involved. 
you know, I think they thought, okay, we're going to do this every spring, but Chad and I don't give up. Chad's the alder person for our district. And we just said, we got to do it again. We're in a momentum now. And we had one city truck, and it's amazing, with 22 volunteers, how we ended up by, from May 18th, we collected 15 1,293 pounds of electronic recycle, and with what we uh, collected in October, October totaled 16,000. Wow. Can you imagine that pile just sitting somewhere where it shouldn't be? 5R yeah. is our recycler, and they very carefully take it apart and do it appropriately so it's not bad for the environment. Uh, that's incredible. Those Isn't are, it? Yes. It is. I actually had the opportunity to tour 5 R's operations up in Ladysmith a number of months ago, actually probably about a year ago now, uh, as we were doing some business um, relocation efforts to try to uh, bring business to the community, try to learn about their operations and see if there was any um, appetite to relocate or expand another operation here. And it was amazing to me the number of people they had just a buzz in that operation, taking apart every piece of electronic and, and separating it so it didn't end up in the landfill. And I think there's a number of pieces that this touches that Kathy touched on. Number one, the volume, the sheer volume. Yeah. The fact that they were able to collect more in a second round it just is, it speaks volumes in terms of the effort that the word is getting out further into these neighborhoods. And Kathy said it's either going to be, in some cases, we saw some on the roofs of homes, electronics mm-hmm. last year, mm-hmm. uh, or I'm sorry, in May, uh, clean up, but whether mm-hmm. front porch or front yard, um, just areas that that isn't really appealing to those that are current residents or future residents that are looking to purchase or maybe even move into a home in that district. Okay, okay, so uh, you got that that cleanup. You did a lot of good cleanup. Yes, yes. And in the process of the cleanup, I I also understand that the folks or local police found some uh, problem areas that they dealt with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the process, you know, there was a two-prong approach, really. First is the cleanup portion that Kathy touched on and covered really well, and making sure that the neighborhood, when it looks good, they feel good, and there's some pride instilled back in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But there's also that element of when it gets dark at night, or even during the daylight hours, that the police department has its activity and and their focus in certain areas. And Kathy can speak a little bit about the neighborhood policing thing, but that's another uh, piece of uh, of the cleanup element that really, I think, has been successful. Uh, did you f- also, in terms of cleanup, since you have mm-hmm. folks that are maybe older or have uh, uh, limitations, physical limitations, and mm-hmm. uh, did you, I know in the past that area has had a, during the uh, day of caring that United Way does, mm-hmm. they uh, there's always been a lot of volunteers in that area to help people that have physical limitations get their yards raked and everything else. Mm-hmm. It, when you're doing this kind of a cleanup, is that a, you know, you know which neighbors are people that might need a little help, a little helping hand. Because we've gotten this group together so well, we have our meetings and we we talk about our neighborhoods and this is the whole key is getting to know your neighbor, finding out who does need the help. And you know, it's not only the raking that we do, but it's even tree trimming and it's hauling clutter from the backyard or their garage or whatever it is to get it to the curb because they're unable to do so. So yeah, we're, we're able to do a little bit more than the raking because our team is that high energy. We've got like, like I said, the 21 of us, we just went from uh, resident residents to residents and we just it was amazing Carl I I the before and after pictures mm-hmm. are the proof you okay. know okay uh, is this something that could be translate or uh, be done in other parts of the city that's the intention is yeah. really to, to hold this example as mm-hmm. a toolkit really so that any resident um, really could take this on and to lead this in their own district or even in their own neighborhood. It doesn't have to cover a, a large area. I know when we orig- originally talked about this, we really talked about focusing on a, on a couple of block. I mean, more than a couple of block, but a smaller block by block area so you're able to make a larger impact in that area. And so I would say absolutely. Um, it's part of the Love Your Block Toolkit or Love Your Block initiative that we launched earlier this year from my office which is really a toolkit that provides city services as a resource, but not as the resource. It's really the neighbors and the residents in that area taking it on for themselves, applying their volunteer hours and time, as opposed to expecting city government to step in and do all the cleanup and the trimming and the garbage hauling away. 
And that's where the business community has been amazing. And Kathy can talk about, even in the second round, what businesses came into the fold that chose to participate. Yeah, let's talk about, we've talked about the residential, but you have a number of businesses in that area. What was their reaction to this effort? Absolutely supportive. Taco John's, uh, Chris, the manager, lives in our district, and he provided tacos for all of the workers and uh, potato olays and chips hamburger donated hamburgers that day. Um, Merlin from IGA provided like chips and corn curls and the water department. We got bottles of water and ocean spray uh, juice bottles and we had donations from the residents baking bars and that. (laughs) Now in the October cleanup we had subways, both subways at the Turnabout on 17th and in the Rapids Mall and then we had IGA again. Merlin's been a great support. He, I mean his business is there, you know. Okay. And uh, very supportive. They're supportive of of the effort. Yes. And and that's actually a smart business. It's because because, you know when (laughs) people see that kind of support from a neighborhood business, guess where they're going to be doing their shopping? Yes, Absolutely, no yes. question. And in addition, they recognize themselves as corporate residents, really, as, right. as people that belong in the community. They're not there just to provide a service to the, to the community, but to really be a part of it. And I think that just, for me, as, as the elected representative of the city, speaks volumes about our willingness to engage and participate in making our community a more vibrant mm-hmm. place to live. And it starts sometimes just in the neighborhoods. How has this process changed the morale or the spirit of the neighborhood? Unbelievable. Carl, whenever I'm out shopping and I'll have a neighbor, one of my neighbors stop and talk to me and either tell me, Kathy, I'm seeing improvement. It's it's not humongous right away, but we're seeing improvement. But then they'll report to me, I'm seeing some tires on the side of the house or I'm seeing some suspicious behavior they re- we're, we're connecting and we're reporting that's the whole key networking oh. so i'm seeing involvement i'm seeing excitement about it and they're also seeing we're not done they it's not a one-time thing this is a commitment for our city okay now she mentions people seeing things and then reporting them on uh, how can uh, how is well we got our 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 first uh, caller on that and, and, Okay. Oh, Put those on the air. And again, the f- phone line is open 424 2600 pound 1320 on your U.S. cellular phone. Uh, good morning. You're on the air with the mayor and, and uh, Kathy. Yes, good morning, and Kathy. I do want to thank you, and yes, this is Helen Streakstra, and we have spoken earlier, and you have sent me some wonderful paperwork, but this has got to go citywide. Our city dollars are taking those trucks, loads of tires, wherever they're taking them, perhaps we're getting paid for the electronics, which I think that should be addressed. How are we disposing of this stuff, and whose who's money and what coffers are they coming out of? They just The tires just don't simply disappear. Um, and how do we then get the... The um, home that we own property by that has 22 tires sitting right now behind a shed with, I think, probably four TVs and five monitors. How do we get them active? I will listen off the air, and then I don't know if you're allowing the whole program for this, but I do have a question for the mayor, if he could um, perhaps on the air or off the air, I don't care, mayor, Mm -hmm. but if you could call and tell us about um, where are we with the wastewater increase in rates? I think it's out out of this world that we are thinking of a uh, rate payer increase. We built that up there for the Beeren and the Rudolph um, wastewater, and now that we are conserving and making uh, best use of ours, it seems that we are still p- potentially into a rate payer increase. And I will listen off the air and keep up the good work, guys, because every little bit helps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Helen. I'll uh, address the wastewater one following Kathy's piece. She's only going to be here for part of the show. So I'll, yeah. I've got that written down, and we'll cover that in the second Yeah, the, Yeah, during the budget, we'll get to all that. But let's talk Ka- about that. Uh, w- what happens to this? Okay. Helen and anybody, everybody out there, the, the key is whenever you see TVs and tires, you please give us a phone call. That's how, it's, how we're going to work this. Um, our goal, first of all, in our district is to eventually – 
work, get enough monies so we can buy our own truck. We want to call it the District 1 truck so that we can be out there neighbors helping neighbors. In other words, if, if they're unable to physically remove these tires and TVs, we will come by and pick them up and take care of them. We do not want this stuff sitting around. If you call us, the other thing we do is... If this is a habitual thing, we then report this to the uh, zoning, you know, inspector. Mm -hmm. Because if this is habitual, they need to know that this is something that they should not, you know, put this debris around their homes. It's the whole neighborhood that's spoiled. Actually, when I was shopping the other day, I had a lady tell me, oh, there's four tires at my neighbor's across the street. So these are how we address it. I'm not on the police force, but I, I feel like I'm a catalyst to help to talk to the zoning inspectors. Many times I even take photos and I send it to them to say, you can't get out here, here's a picture, this is what's happening. And so a phone call to us, to me, would be fine, Helen. And if you have any concerns, I'm always willing to discuss them. But I think she, uh, Helen had a great question about how do you get somebody involved and right I think there were a couple of homes uh, residences that um, were own not owner occupied they were on, they were occupied by renters mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and I think there were some some really good stories and and maybe not uh, we won't get into the full details on air but I right. think Kathy if you could maybe speak about the approach simply by going to the home okay and pounding on the door well we were very fortunate we had Nate our neighborhood watch police officer and he was very involved with us because we needed to keep our people safe because we didn't know who we were going to confront and we didn't want to make people angry we're here to get involved not to judge we're not going to judge the way people live but anyhow Nate would knock at the door and tell them there's a lot of debris around your house and we have a team of people here that can help you with this today and are you willing to you know receive this help it was unbelievable it was just like 12 people converged and we had it all done within an hour from tires to TVs to trash to even broken glass we had made sure we had industrial gloves to go in the back because there were children that lived here but it was beautiful to see that happen and again not to make people dependent on us, but when there's an inappropriate residence that's in decay and it's totally with clutter, we need to yeah. make sure, make a point with it. And that's where our police department really helped us. And I called Nate the catalyst because he really helped us that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going neighbor by neighbor, neighbor and knocking by neighbor, on the door. Knocking. That really worked this time. Previous, Chad and I would ride around in his truck and I'd write down who we need to approach. And I would put a, a little letter in their mailbox saying, we're going to be coming around this Saturday. Please be open to, you know, some help from us, you know, that type of thing. But it worked when we had the police department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then that leads into, like, the neighborhood watch effort yes. to yes. uh how is that going to be coordinated you have your police officer uh in the neighborhood how is that going to be coordinated what's the next steps mm -hmm. okay i we're going to have a meeting tomorrow at the city hall at 10 o'clock in the morning in that meeting room on the first floor and everyone's invited if they're interested even from other districts because we're here to really show that this ward really wants to be involved in this and we're going to connect it with neighborhood watch I try to be real careful with that term because yep. of all the news today we call it the neighborhood volunteer group because some people are very skeptical about I don't know if I want you know so this okay, is what, what we've come up with my point is to get to know your neighbor Okay. In other words, so that you know their comings and goings, if there's something suspicious. Attend meetings so we can be involved and connected. Secure your own home. If you have a question, call the police department. I had Nate come and look at our house and tell us about our doors. Look out for each other. In okay. other words, care about each other. Learn how to report. Color of car, make of car, license plate. And notify your block leader if you're going to be gone for a long period of time. And be connected with your street, your neighborhood leader, and get involved because this is what it's all about. Okay. I guess the whole thing is getting people together, mm -hmm. talking, yes. working together, communicating. And with that, good things happen down the road. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, um, to Helen's question, too, about what are the city resources that are being poured into this? Mm-hmm. And frankly, um, the second cleanup was very different than the first yes. in the sense of how many city vehicles and any sort of um, involvement of, of city dollars, taxpayer dollars, mm-hmm. for example. You know, the police department, that's in their purview. That's a fixed cost to the city. Um, and I would stress that this has been kind of a changing of the perception in terms of the way the PD works in neighborhoods. And I think mm-hmm. that's been a positive mm-hmm. uh, in speaking with the chief regularly about this, the fact that the residents that live in these neighborhoods can be the eyes and the ears and an extension of the police department. And so by realizing them as partners in this, they can further the impact in terms of the work that they're trying to do. Well, I have a Wood County uh, Sheriff on the show uh, for his call-in every month. And uh, Sheriff Reichert has made that point that, uh, especially in rural areas of Mm -hmm. Wood County, that it's important for neighbor. If you see something that looks strange, (laughs) Mm -hmm. report it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, Because it's important for everybody to be involved. And that's the best way to prevent stuff or clean up things if uh, something bad is going on in an area. And to the other question, too, about the electronics and any revenues that were yeah. derived, 5R, um, their business model is such that they will bring a semi and a crew and anything that they need to get the electronics from the homes, essentially, into their semi so they can take it back. Um, we've never engaged, in fact, uh, from what we've learned about their business, they're in the penny business, that any penny that they're able to um, afford instead of giving back in terms of revenue that affords them to be able to provide the service so the revenues from the electronics haven't been haven't been anything uh, as in terms of the tires because there typically is a cost associated with getting rid of the tires we've been exploring uh, sources because the city does have a number of tires that we collect from any sort of fleet vehicle pd fire or street mm-hmm. department vehicles to finding a better source so they're not costing the city uh, anything significant to get rid of so really those are the two answers i guess to those questions regarding revenues and expenses um the second uh, cleanup this fall we only had um, i believe one uh, city volunteer mm-hmm. one supervisor mm-hmm. um, that assisted that day mm-hmm. so um you know the hope is that this isn't a city-led um, initiative it's really a resident-led resident engaged solution but the city can assist because there's a cost to the city if we don't do this and there's a cost if we do and i think we can mitigate the cost by doing this in a long-term proposition yeah the law uh, uh, leaving it go results in more cleanup and higher costs down the line we got another caller before we take our first break i want to let them and get in on the discussion uh good morning you're on the air good morning i'm calling in regards to the first district yes you're right i live in that and i am not very impressed okay um yeah, you pick up certain houses, you know, that need the, the work, but what about the houses that are rental houses around here that have not mowed their lawn, have not done anything? No, they should have to do it just like anybody else in this neighborhood has to do it. Mm-hmm. I'll listen on the air. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, let's go. Uh, you always... D- Rental properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Kathy's always looking for feedback, and she can maybe speak to a little bit about that. Okay. Very good. Thank you for this call, because this is the awareness that we need to have about when we get our new inspector. This is what I believe is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. We're going to work very closely with this inspector. Part of my goal, and that's in the, we're going to talk about that at the meeting tomorrow, one of our goals is for education. With each of our neighborhood leaders, in other words, each avenue is going to have a leader, we're going to distribute information on all of the ordinances that are, you know, are in our city. And if they're not followed up on, we're going to have an inspector, there's going to be a follow-up. Our, our goal is we're going to be the angels to work with the inspector. The other thing is I just really want to have a meeting with the Landlord Association and nothing threatening just to share information just so that we can work together as a team. My other thought is for the other districts, get to know your alder person and get them involved and start this. And I was thinking about Helen and and about the other parts of the city is just get it started. It takes one person, call your alder person, call your mayor, Mm -hmm. It happens. It okay. works. Um, but that call is symptomatic of mm-hmm. a problem that's existed for, I don't know, yes. eons in this city. Mm-hmm. And some of the rental properties have owners who are out of state. Yes. yes, a number of them do. In fact, this exercise has proven to us that we do need to get an understanding, a better understanding of what are right. the the 
uh, owner-occupied residences, and then what are the renter-occupied residences, residences, and then what number of them are owned by landlords out of the city and out of the state, and, and et cetera. So I think the better we have an understanding of that, we have a better understanding of who we have to work with. And to the caller's point, I, I completely agree yes. that there is only so much that a resident-led, resident-engaged mm-hmm. group can do. They're not going to be mowing people's lawns. They're not going to be doing anything more than just the curb appeal that she's been speaking to. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a great segue into the second half of this call, or the second half of the show this morning, is around the budget. And one of the pieces we've proposed um, is historically our ordinance control program has been very ineffective as of late. Um, we've had a revolving door in terms of people that have been in as the inspector or the ordinance control officer uh, in those positions. And they're part-time. Uh, they're often going to school, which is great. But the position has really um, been set up as in a very ineffective way. And so by instead of having three part-time ordinance control officers, one that deals with recycling who's never written a citation, and then the other two which write very few citations and typically work on education, is we get these chronic issues where callers like, like herself recognize issues that are regularly occurring in these neighborhoods and that's not acceptable for a city to allow that to happen from my perspective so uh, we did budget for a full-time ordinance control officer next year so you have consistency continuity and you've got somebody that can work directly with residents who want to get a group like this started in their own neighborhood Um, so to that issue um, absolutely and and provided council's approval of of the next steps of this position uh, we will have somebody on board that'll take this firsthand and be able to deal with them in a much more concentrated approach. And I would urge that caller to attend your meeting tomorrow morning. Absolutely. Uh, and you are get invited. Your, yeah, yes. get, and get your other. If you got other people that share that same concern, come to the meeting. Well, Bring I, it up. Absolutely. I've had a, a neighbor call me because they were concerned about a house across the street that was a rental. And we did follow up on it. We did our reporting with the car that was parked there, the license plate. We called it in, all that type of thing. So we're we do follow up on it and sometimes we come to a dead end where the person is incarcerated or something you know what is is ideal is elgin city of elgin i think i've told you mm-hmm. about that too you go on the website El- city of elgin and go into the planning and illinois so- elgin, elgin illinois. illinois and all landlords have to be licensed they have to be uh, pay a fee to own a property and then they are inspected every year for the first five years Then after that, they realize, okay, they're going to be okay landlords. We don't want to be Gestapo and be frighten everybody that owns property. But the thing is, just to be responsible, if you're going to buy it and they leave town, have somebody locally to mow the lawn. Or if they need help, call our district alderman. Chad and I work, we problem solve very well together on our issues. Okay. Well, we have to take our first break, and then mm-hmm. we're going to be back with the mayor. Kathy, I, want to, uh, I know you're going, but again, the time of the meeting tomorrow? Is at 10 o'clock at the City Hall, uh, the first floor. First floor uh, conference room at City Hall, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, anybody from any district is uh, invited uh, to learn more about this effort, and we'll take it from there. If you have concerns, that's the place to go and, and visit and voice and, and, and speak your mind. Speak that's your right. peace. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you again, Kathy. It's Thank nice you, to Kyle. see someone as enthusiastic as you about our city. I okay. am. I okay. am. Okay. Spread I the energy. Keep okay. it yeah, I spread the energy. Well, I don't know. But we had some nice compliments from uh, Tourism Secretary. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 Stephanie Klett yesterday mm-hmm. about yes. the city of Wisconsin Rapids. Oh, excellent. Did she join? Was she here? Uh, uh, she, I had her on, on the news line. Oh, good. Okay. Did an, and she mentioned this is a very unique, unique city. city. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. Goes, it has a combination of, uh, of industrial, industrial uh, 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 medical, uh, medical and histor- and historical, historical, natural be- beauty, and, it, uh, and friendly people. And she said it's a very... And, you know, she kind of called it a special gem. Mm-hmm. A gem. And, you know, Carl, that's why I'm enthused. Let's clean it up and let's make it that special gem. So, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank okay, you. Mayor, uh, take care. Okay. And with that, we're going to wrap up you. part one of today's edition of the Morning Magazine, which, as always, is brought to you by Riverview Medical Center. With you, it's personal and comfort air. Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at Mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. 
Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. Once again, here's Carl Hilke. Thank you, Jerry, and welcome back, everybody, to today's show on AM 1320 and WFHR.com and also on River Cities Media, which is here. Jesse's here to uh, digitally record our discussion, and Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Zach Verwink is here uh, for the entire show, and the phone lines are open at 424-2600, pound 1320 on your U.S. cellular phone. The city has adopted a budget, and let's get into that, Your Honor, because everybody wants to know, okay, what's happening to my taxes? And one of the things people sometimes, well, my taxes go up. I go, well, which jurisdiction? They go, huh? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's do a little education about, sure. first off, about the city tax rate, what the, what do you understand the overall tax rate to mm-hmm. be, and, and the like, and uh, if people are upset about something where <laughs> they can vent. Yeah, well, great questions, uh, Carl, and I think they're, you know, we can repeat this many times on our show just to keep educating. I think it's important that we do so. Um, so obviously those residents that, that pay city taxes, um, in light of levy limits from the state of Wisconsin, we don't have the ability to levy many new additional taxes. Um, we're tied to net new construction, so it's based on whatever new construction is uh, occurring in the city is is predicated about how much tax, new taxes we can levy. So let's start off with that and make sure people understand that. So um, there's very little ability for municipalities, good or bad. People can agree and disagree on, on why or if that's a good thing. Um, so from the city's perspective, our tax rate has gone down. Um, but because we're in a reevaluation year, that also allows for some complexities. So uh, it really depends on, so if the question is, to answer the question in kind of a succinct way, if you have a $100,000 home and your assessment went up 6%, which was the average, which your assessment would be $106,000 on that home, your taxes shouldn't have much of an increase. And if they do, you know, we're projecting a 9 or a $10 increase. Now, one thing we don't have in yet is the school credit. So everybody has that credit on their tax right. bill. Um, that information won't be available until December. So really to answer the question well, um, there's got to be a couple things have to be figured out first. One, did their assessment go up or down or stay the same? If the assessment stayed the same, then they, they probably will have a tax decrease. If it went down, they may have a tax decrease as well. Um, but if their assessment went up above the average of 6%, then they likely will have some sort of tax increase. And that's based on the shifting of property tax base. And that's what, what really determines what the property, I mean, it all starts with the value of a piece of property. Okay. And it goes from there. Okay. But in terms of the rate that the city is charging, it went down. The, t- the tax rate did go down. Okay. Because we were able to capture $50 million more of value in the assessment that okay. happened this year. And the big reason for that is because um, we all saw in the news over the last decade of what the housing market has done right. for residential, but even the commercial market that affects the commercial market rate of value of property. So um, over over the course of that period, we were down about 90 or so percent of assessed value, meaning the properties were worth more, but they were assessed at a 10 percent reduction from what they uh, were expected to be. So 6 percent was the average of what most property went up in the city. What, what about in terms of overall spending in the city? Is it mm-hmm. going up, going down, staying the same? Because that's a concern of people. Uh, well, you know, it's a concern of all of ours, and that's something we pay deep attention to monthly throughout the year, because this is something that uh, when you pass a budget, you have to make sure a balanced budget, right? Number one, cities have to pa- pass a balanced budget. They can't run in a deficit. Um, secondly, uh, the piece around uh, spending, that we have to watch spending or cost increases because that will force us to change priorities throughout the year. So if we have an uh, incredible increase in amount of, of snow removal, for example, now we do carry some reserves to offset peaks and valley, the, really the peaks of snow removal costs. But let's say we exhaust all of our reserves and we have to continue to buy more material, salt or sand or whatever the material might be, and the additional labor costs that we're projecting that we didn't project for, didn't account for because of a snow, big snow season, um, then of course we have to change priorities some, at some point during the year. But we also carry contingency from year to year to offset that as well. So I mean, there's a number of factors on the spending side. Now, in terms of spending for 2014, we only levied twenty thousand dollars more uh, in tax in our tax levy. It only grew by twenty thousand dollars, and that's based on very small amount of construction in the previous year. Uh, so, in terms of spending, 
there's really only twenty thousand dollars of additional new spending in the budget, and and really it's kind of ironic given the fact that um, we have a two percent wage increase uh, based on our union negotiations from the previous year. We we negotiate a two-year contract, um, so in, in accounting for that, and then just any general cost increases of doing business, and everyone knows that year over year there's a cost of living increase, so therefore that mm-hmm. affects the services that the city buys and materials the city buys, the road materials, all of that. So. Surprisingly, with all of that said, uh, we're able to do the same and a bit more with just the resources that we already have. Now, um, going to our caller in the first segment, who mm-hmm. talked about uh, on the water issue and the water, and light, uh, care to address that? You know, I think um, we, I do have some good information that the finance director was able to prepare on this subject that I think should get out into the public eye uh, because, and I'll do my best to, to review it over the air. It's hard to talk numbers on the air. Yeah, I know. You can't see them. So I'll do my best to not speak too much on the numbers. But essentially, um, there's a couple of issues that drove the wastewater uh, conversation. And I'm very sensitive to the caller's question regarding why ratepayers should have to pick up additional costs. Well, there's a number of reasons for this. So we'll, let's walk through them. I think the first reason why um, the increase occurs, uh, and it's factual, not I think, uh, is because of the additional costs that are incurred to operate the plant. We've got some very large industrial users who employ a lot of people, so there's a positive to that. But there's also in the amount of waste and the type of waste they're sending us that's costing us more to treat. Um, and in that case, it's a, it's forcing us to add a chemical called polymer uh, to offset that that issue. Now, that's something that there's a Lean Six Sigma project, a rapid improvement project occurring around that right now to try to mitigate that cost in the future. It, Previously, we spent 6000 a year on polymer. Now we're projecting to spend 120000 plus on polymer. So there's a big jump that, yeah. that you just can't absorb into your operations. So let's walk through that budget just so everyone can understand. Uh, let's start on the expense side of things. One of the items that we talked a bit about, it was reported in the newspaper, I think we talked on air a little bit about it, is the sewer utility billing. Mm -hmm. Um, The Water Works and Lighting um, Commission does the sewer utility billing for the city because they generate the water bill and they generate the electric bill. And that's all based on how much water is consumed. So they generate the utility bill for us. Well, last year they invested in um, some new metering technology, Mm -hmm. and um, which is automatic metering. And that resulted in an increase in the cost of that service. Originally, we were projecting some $80,000 um, based on what we were able to negotiate and, and even with some additional review of the numbers, get that down to only an increase of about 39000 and only is still a kind of... But a, that's still a big improvement it's a, from 80000 It's a significant cost, but it's also a significant reduction from what we were originally projecting. Um, we did have some other reduction in expenses in that area of about 22000 So, um, you know, based on that, that's the one piece. And I think let's also speak about on the expense side of things, just to prove to the listener and, and to the plant operators, um, to their a testament to their work, and that is that we had about a 312000 reduction in expenses to operate the plant in terms of what we're projecting for 2014. So couple that with um, the need to maintain a certain amount of of um, debt service. Uh, we have a clean water fund loan that goes to the state and we're required to maintain 110 um, percent of return uh, of that clean water fund loan cost. So we have to pay that loan back to the, to the clean water fund loan and we're supposed to maintain 10 percent more to cover that in terms of kind of a contingency. So let's go on to the revenue side of things. So in any business, you balance your revenues and expenses. Right, right. When you have something that goes out of whack, that results in a right. rate increase. So with the $312,000 of expenditure decrease, um, there was some, some significant reduction in revenues. And the first item was the sewer use fees of 85000 That's the use to the home, um, the fee that we charge. And, and so part of that was because of the re- reduction in, in water usage or conservation. Um, so while many would agree, and I would agree, that reduction in water use is a great thing, um, ultimately that water that's not being used is not being sent to the treatment plant, so there's no revenue being derived from that gallon or, or right. number of gallons of water. So that re- resulted in an $85,000 reduction we're projecting in sewer use fees. Our septic haulers that we charge has continually, continuously declined. Uh, we're projecting a $15,000 uh, revenue in that item, so that's a $5,000 reduction. 
The one piece uh, that I know that is important to, to listeners if, they're, if they've been following this is the municipal service agreements. So um, Rudolph connected into our system right. uh, this year, uh, as well as Beerin. We just negotiated a connection, which is not reflected in this yet because they won't be connecting until uh, sometime in the future. This is for their new business work. park. It is related to the new business park, exactly. But the um, municipal service agreement resulted in about a $73,000 increase in revenue. So Previously, we were collecting about 94000 um, in 2013, only 80000 in 12. Uh, but this year, we're projecting $167,000 in revenue from the municipal service agreement. And then the other item was what they call the waterworks and lighting blow-off revenue. Um, their commission, the Waterworks and Lighting Commission, uh, voted to improve their process, which would reduce the cost that they incur to um, deal with what they call blow-off revenue. So part of their treatment of water they result in wastewater from okay. that process. So they are changing um, their process, <clears throat> which we're projecting a, a reduction in about $42,000 in revenue that was previously about $75,000 uh, in terms of the cost to the city, uh, and cost to the commission that was a revenue to the city. So, you know, overall, the charges for service, we call that, mm -hmm. we've had a reduction of about $50,000. Um, couple that with the revenue increase from other municipalities and then the, the, the reduction that we're getting from other users is about $50,000 shortfall. So then going through the other financing sources, um, the question was, you know, there's a 5% rate increase. Um, could it have been more? Could it have been less? Could it have been zero? Um, we did apply um, about $172,000 of reserves. The rate increase will bring the treatment plant or the sewer utility fund about $163,000 in additional revenue. So we matched that essentially with the amount of reserves. We didn't expect um, that, the, uh, that the residents or the users could bear sustain and frankly i don't think you know I, i'm not a supporter of the five percent but at the end of the day the treatment plant has to operate and so when you do reduce your cost of water consumption right, when the water consumption revenues go down the treatment plant cost to, uh, to operate stays the same so regardless of how much water is consumed it does nothing to benefit the treatment plant okay so, okay long term or mm -hmm. is this looking like it's going to be a one-time thing or well, we projected about a $334,000 deficit for next year. So you do the 5% rate increase, and then you bring in some, some reserves of $172,000. That is projected to balance the budget. Now, going into fast forward to budget 2015, let's say, um, if this polymer project comes to fruition, where they're reducing their polymer usage, um, then we shouldn't be projecting any sort of major increase in the future in this respect. Now, that has to pan out. There's no question about it. Otherwise, we're going to be back in a similar position with some sort of deficit. We only matched half of our shortfall with a rate increase. There's some other revenue sources that we're looking at. We're in the process of negotiating with the landfill on their leachate. Um, that was an item I didn't mention that we're, we're deriving about $10,000 more from this next year uh, than we have done in previous years in revenues for treatment of the leachate that's generated off the landfill, the water that comes from the landfill. So there's a lot of moving parts to this budget mm. in terms of the sewer utility. It's the revenues, it's the expenses, and trying to figure out and get a handle on what are the cost drivers, what are these new costs. So we did reduce expenditures of the plant at 312000 but your revenues yeah. were such that, you know, lost that much. So um, I, I do want to talk about, and I'm, maybe the next question you might be wondering is, what other municipalities in our region, what is what is their situation? Yeah, hey, I was just thinking that. Yeah, and so this is the one document I think that needs to get out there because the budget is the budget. People can review it and the numbers are the numbers. They're, they're factual, there's not a whole lot you can do. Granted, there's more that we can do to reduce expenses at the plant, but that's gonna take some time. That's not gonna happen overnight. So we did a little bit of review of other municipalities. Um, let's speak to the households, because most of the callers, I'm guessing, are residential um, homeowners, uh, residential users. Um, let's take a look at the monthly rate. Um, so the 5% increase uh, that we're talking about on an average household, which the average household uses about 4,500 gallons of water a month, uh, the average increase on their bill uh, would be $1.55 a month. Uh, so that's the cost that we're, we're anticipating that the average household um, would incur by the increase of a 5% increase. And again, I don't stand for any increase, but when the budget's the budget and you've done everything you can on the expense side, the revenue side has to do something. 
So a dollar fifty-five a month increased costs. So then the next question is, what other municipalities? What are their minimum charges, and then what are their volume charges? Now let's take the city of Marshfield for example. Um, their minimum charge is eighteen dollars and fifteen cents a month. So that's the expected cost every month to the resident in the city of Marshfield. Our cost minimum charge is thirteen dollars and eighty cents. Uh, so there's about a five dollar, a little bit less than a five dollar difference. Is we're cheaper than the city of Marshfield uh, in terms of cost to the uh, to the residential user. The city of Stevens Point is a bit cheaper uh, at $9.83 as a minimum charge per month. Um, well, that's, and how much does the university affect that, I wonder? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, they obviously have more users, and so when the pool gets larger yeah. to choose from, um, they're able to bear expenditures a lot higher than what city of Rapids or even the city of Marshfield, for example, based on their population. So we have yeah. to we have to take one quick sure, break. Yep. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll, be, we'll continue uh, our discussion with Mayor Verwink right after this. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, Turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. Welcome back as we wrap up our hour-long discussion with Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Zach Verwink. Okay, uh, let's continue our, our mm-hmm. tutorial yeah, <laughs> on right. wastewater. Yeah, it's, it's a bit to digest. Um, the, the last piece I want to point out uh, regarding the rates with other municipalities is what the average bills are to residents. So we talked about the minimum charge. That's the fixed yeah. cost on everybody's bill. Um, the other piece that we'll take it a step further, the city of Wisconsin Rapids, um, the monthly sewer charge for an average home is about $32.50 a month. Um, city of Stevens Point's bills are $29.69 a month, and the city of Marshfield's is $40.83 a month. So we're about $3 more than the city of Stevens Point is a month, and then we're about $8 cheaper than the city of Marshfield a month. Okay, okay. So it's it's an issue uh, all municipalities are facing in some form or the other. In terms, uh, real quickly, Your Honor, uh, of this budget, what's the what's the major thing you're trying to accomplish with it? Well, there's a number of new approaches we introduced at the last um, call or the last uh, the last uh, time we were on the air, which will be playing out in the HR committee in the, in the coming weeks, in the coming month or two, uh, is number one, the ordinance control position. Right. Taking a much different approach, a more proactive approach to dealing with chronic nuisance and chronic blight issues, um, but also working with the residents in the process. The other part, um, and I, I'll jump back to sewer utility just real quick, um, and that's important to most callers and most listeners is the fact of what are we doing in economic development efforts. Right now we're in negotiations and we're going to be hosting a site visit with a company um, that would be an additional sewer utility user. So that's great news if we can land them in the city. They're very interested in Wisconsin Rapids and so we're very excited to host them. This visit was rescheduled uh, because some of their executive team couldn't make it into the city. So uh, we're hoping. We're we're, we're, we're hoping and and Remember you see some people here to be nice to them. You Mm -hmm. don't know that could be, be this team. (laughs) They'll be here just for a day, and and, uh, we want to make sure that they're wowed with the city and they leave with the understanding that they need to be in Wisconsin. We want you here. That's right. So um, other initiatives, next steps of the budget is really just the implementation. Most of the budget is just general operations, and there's only so much you can do to to change that and reprioritize that in one given year. Um, There are a number of tech initiatives that we introduced in the budget. Uh, One was a director of innovation and technology. The city hasn't had somebody that has steered special projects. Projects, um, for the mayor or really for any tech initiative ever in the city history. Um, so this will be an opportunity for us to modernize a lot of our city operations through the use of technology. Um, you know, processes do become outdated over time. Oh, and, and you waste money with old processes. That's right. They're inefficient and you do find waste. And so it isn't necessarily ways, you know, reducing headcount again. It's finding what you can do with those dollars that were spent probably ineffectively or inefficiently in the past. And that speaks to the rapid improvement, the Lean Six Sigma. Those six or seven projects Mm -hmm. are moving forward right now, um, which is very exciting to watch their progress because ultimately they're doing a diligence to the taxpayer. They're finding better, faster, and cheaper ways to do the same service with a better customer satisfaction ratio at the end. 
Okay. Well, uh, I wish you and everybody well. <laughs> a budget time is never a fun time. <laughs> and uh, I thank you for the time. And I wanna, we want to uh, thank Kathy, too, for mm-hmm. being part of today's show. And uh, wish you and uh, everybody at City Hall and Kathy and everybody in, in their d- ward in their district a happy Thanksgiving. Yes, and all of our listeners, ha- happy and safe Thanksgiving. And be safe in the woods. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And with that, we'll wrap up today's edition of the Morning Magazine. We'll join CBS right after this.